Nick Dranny is constitutional law expert with the Goldwater Institute in Phoenix. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Within an hour of the Supreme Court's ruling on Thursday, the Goldwater Institute had already announced that it would be renewing a challenge to a part of the Affordable Care Act. Can you detail that for us? Liberty took a body blow today, but it's not down for the count. We still have a challenge to the Independent Payment Advisory Board, what uh, Sarah Palin called the death panel, which is pending. And that challenge is actually made stronger by the portion of the decision that struck down the individual mandate under the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause. So we will pursue that challenge to the health care law with fervor and until the end. Now, that part of the law doesn't have to do with the uh, individual payer mandate as it was being called before the decision, or does it? It, it has nothing to do with it except that it happens to be in the same 2,000-plus page bill that nobody read before they passed it. Uh, what it does is it empowers an executive agency to wield nearly every power of government to try to hit a cost containment schedule that is established by the law. And our belief is that that unconstitutionally concentrates power in violation of the doctrine of separation of powers. And moreover, since that power only has its origination in the Commerce Clause, today's decision striking down the individual mandate under the Commerce Clause and recognizing that there are limits to the Commerce Clause power should strengthen our lawsuit. If Congress were to pass an amendment to the law that gave that board congressional oversight, would that then pass constitutional muster in your opinion? That alone, no. That would be a move in the right direction. One of the major problems with the bill is it purports to say that it can't be repealed or amended by com Congress uh, without supermajority requirements. And then in the case of repeal, it actually tries to limit Congress's ability to repeal it until January of 2017. Now, those provisions are clear violations of the separation of powers in that Congress cannot entrench its laws meaning cannot sort of lock down its laws and protect them from being repealed by future Congresses. So that's just one defect in addition to many other defects that require a total rewrite of that section. Do you anticipate that there will be other challenges, or do you know of any other challenges that will be brought to the fore now that the Supreme Court has ruled? And will Goldwater be involved in any of those? Goldwater is going to be examining this decision in detail and look for other opportunities to challenge the Commerce Clause elements of the uh, health care law. Now, the thing to understand is that although the individual mandate was upheld as a tax, not all portions of the uh, health care law can be classified as a tax. Most portions of the health care law have to be found to be supported in the Commerce Clause. And now that the Commerce Clause has been much more uh, strengthened, or I should say has been restricted and limited in a fashion that uh, was not as clear before today, we may have opportunities to go after other provisions in this law in addition to the IPAP. And yet, uh, the way the case was argued before the court, everything was tied to that uh, individual mandate. So if it stood, the rest of it stood, with the exception, of course, of the Medicaid clause. Is that not correct? Well, it's not technically accurate. The, the argument was directed to the constitutionality of the mandate, and the other provisions came into play only on the question of severability, which means that the question was, if the individual mandate is unconstitutional, do we strike down the entire law? The fact that they held the individual mandate constitutional and chose, therefore, not to strike down the rest of the law doesn't validate provisions that were not specifically and independently challenged. Those challenges can still be brought. And what about the decision on the Medicaid clause that eliminates the penalty against states that don't take on the expanded Medicaid program. Uh, was that a victory of any sort for uh, the conservatives who've argued against this bill in general? Actually, it was a, a, probably the only silver lining in this decision apart from the Commerce Clause uh, aspects of it. Um, the most important part about the Medicaid decision is that it brought on board both Justice Kagan and Justice uh, Breyer. So the decision striking down the effort by Congress to blackmail the states into adopting the expanded Medicaid provisions uh, was 7 to 2, which is, a, is an indication that we have a very powerful 
uh, legal weapon in our arsenal to challenge federal overreach in the future. We have just about a minute remaining, and in that, one, that time I want to ask you to comment on where Chief Justice Roberts was, not only on this, but earlier in the week on the immigration uh, decision that came down in the Arizona case. A surprise to you, and what do you think was going on there? I'd like to say it was a surprise to me, but I've actually anticipated that uh, Chief Justice Roberts was in the, was in the mix and in, in play uh, to, to join with the liberal faction of the court for over a year now. Uh, my main concern about Chief Justice Roberts is his adherence to uh, what he believes is judicial uh, modesty. Uh, my fear has always been that he, rather than enforcing the Constitution as it means, even when you know, a significant result and a disruptive result could occur, that he would shy away from that. And, uh, and I think that's what we've seen in the past couple of decisions, that uh, out of the uh, supposed doctrine of judicial modesty, uh, he has chosen to refrain from engaging unconstitutional acts by Congress or unconstitutional efforts by Congress uh, for fear that it might cause too much uh, disruption of what the political uh, branches want to do. Nick Dranius of the Goldwater Institute, thanks so much for speaking with me today. Thanks for having me.